Welcome. Rather than repeat the filmed lecture that is available to you on the BLE, because of course, a lot of this is of historical significance and there's no real way of updating that history as it occurred. Well, I do want to interrogate parts of that, bring things a little bit forward into the impact of earlier Maori rebellion to the feelings of Maori today. But I thought that what might be useful is to give some appreciation of Maori language, Maori culture, Maori values. After all, one rebels based on values. And this rebellion is not well understood. It's understood in what is loosely called the New Zealand Wars, probably more rightly called the Land Wars of New Zealand, or to use the Maori word for New Zealand, Aotearoa. White settler colonialism with the emphasis on settlerdom meant the desire to settle on land. And this land was appropriated often by illegal and violent means. So it's clear that the Maori effort to resist had at a very early stage to resist in terms of responding to violence with violence. So the filmed lecture from previous years reflects this. I'll go into a little bit of that later. But first of all, I wanted to give you some background into the author of an amazing book. It's called Redemption Songs, A Life of Te Kuti Ari Kirangi Te Turuki, who was a Maori leader against white settler colonialism from the Urawera region of New Zealand. And a legendary figure who's inspired people to this day, a member of the Tuhoi people, the Maori people were divided into several what were loosely called tribes, but different communities. And he basically resisted in the name not only of Maori values, but the admixture of those values with Christian values. This is the imprint of the missionary outreach to New Zealand. The missionary archives related to missionary outreach all over the world from this country are actually contained here at SOAS. So those of you who are anxious to look at the correspondence, the documentation from this period, that's available to people on special request. But Redemption Songs is the title of this book by the late Professor Judith Binney, a very old friend of mine. The name Binney was her earlier married name. She was married to Don Binney, who was also my art teacher, a very, very famous New Zealand artist. New Zealand society, as you're beginning to appreciate, is very small. But what this meant was that the whole idea of Maori rebellion had to be based on a degree of intimacy within one's iwi, or one's own people, or one's own community. And this kind of intimacy, as well as a sense of injustice, which had to be resisted, and a defense of one's honor, and a recognition in terms of honor, of what it meant to be a good person. Judith Binney, despite all of the accolades that she won, she became a Dane. She won all the New Zealand academic prizes. Nevertheless, to her deathbed, cherished 
the title that she had been given by the Maori people. Let me read you her funeral oration in Maori, so you get a sense of the language. E honore, e honore, e roria, mongarongo ki te whenua, wakaro pae, ki na tangata katoa, ake, 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 amine. Te atua te peringa, toko ranga te honore. He, okoria, funga rongo ki te whenua, makaro pae, ki na tangata katoa, ake, 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 amine te atua te peringa, toko ranga. Toku oranga, toku oranga. That was delivered by the Maori community at her funeral, even though she herself was not Maori, but she was accepted very, very much as a member of the Maori community and indeed the Maori nation. And the title they gave her, which she cherished far more than her damehood, Te Toma Irange o Te Aroha. It means that you are like the dew that falls upon the earth from heaven. I don't think you could get a kinder, more honorable accolade than that to be called the water from heaven that refreshes the earth. That's really something. So when she died, it was a cause of great mourning. A cause of very, very great mourning, not only in the New Zealand academic world and in the Maori world, also in the entire world, which has sought to forge some kind of good race relations between white New Zealanders and Maori New Zealanders. Complicated in more recent times by influxes of migration from other parts of the world. A large Asian, largely Chinese influx in different stages. The original gold miners of the 19th century. The people who escaped from the Japanese invasion of China in World War II, my own family, war refugees that reached New Zealand at that point in time. Those who came to New Zealand because they're trying to escape Hong Kong as it was handed over to the mainland Chinese. Chinese people who fled from Vietnam after its fall to the communists and more recent migrations of people who are business related from China today. Distinct generations, they complicate the whole question of race relations in New Zealand, as do people who've migrated from the South Pacific. It's not always easy to understand why, because they look the same at first sight. Maori people and people from Polynesia don't always get on. Similar values, but different histories. The history of Maori values is one forged in war, but also one forged in terms of very, very codified forms of honor. Honor and community responsibility. So, New Zealand political philosopher Andrew Sharp, basically in one of his long books on the subject, postulated that the key Maori attribute from which we could all learn is one of kindness. This can be expressed in terms of chivalry. And in the Maori wars of liberation, and I'll call them that because that's what they were trying to do, 
There was much chivalry. In one of the final great battles in the area of Taranaki, that's very, very much part of the western part of the North Island of the country. The Maori and European armies met in pitched battle. The Maoris were dug into what they called their pa, a fortified area, a defensive area. The Europeans had cannon. And so they used heavy firepower to demolish the fortifications. The Maoris had rifles. They had learned that you had to answer fire with fire. It's just their firepower wasn't as heavy as the European firepower. Maori warriors, male and female, made a last stand at Taranaki. Even though two things stand out. The first, that in no man's land between the two armies, Maori soldiers would go out and rescue wounded European soldiers and return them to European lines. The European commanders were amazed at what they called this chivalry. So much so that the European general offered honorable surrender. Lay down your weapons, you can go. And I think I signaled this to you at last week's lecture. The reply of the Maori general standing at what was left of his earthworks, basically saying that it weren't going to resist anymore. Or would they? Oh, yes, we'll resist. We're going to fight you forever. Okay. 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 The garrison, the Maori garrison broke out that night and managed to get to freedom with their rifles. The war spluttered on. One of the high points of the Maori resistance, however, was its adaptation, its pragmatic adaptation to basically their recognition that modernity, whether you like it or not, had come. So they elected a king. In other words, they wanted to unite the different tribal communities. Elected a king who took on the trappings of government. There was even a postmaster general. The whole idea was that if you go to fight the Europeans, you have to fight fire with fire. The armies were given modern weapons, modern training, an effort at modern unity. If, for instance, the Europeans were united under a queen, then the Maori had to be united under a king. The middle of the North Island in what is called the Waikato area is still to this day called the King Country. And that's where he made his stand. But it was a very, very curious, as it were, conflation of influences. And I'll come on to this when I talk about the life of the great military, but also religious leader, Tekuti, the subject of the book written by my former colleague, teacher, mentor, Professor Judith Binney. But the Maori king, in trying to unite everybody underneath one umbrella, he wasn't ever quite successful. There were always separate warlords trying to conduct their own resistance. Basically, took on the mantle of a biblical leader. And that's the Tekuti. And the idea of being a biblical leader meant that you had to undergo certain rites of passage before God. So like Jesus going up into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, the Maori king, Patata I, went to the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. Now he knew that he had been elected as a compromise. He was the one who incited the least divisiveness didn't mean that he was going to be able to 
unite everybody. He just wasn't going to divide people any further. And so I wrote a book of poems about this. I wrote this on my balcony in London when I was completing my own master's degree back in 1977. It was published in Canada, Songs of the Maori King, by the Solonese Press, a branch of the University of British Columbia Press. It's out of print. It's one of those books that once upon a time, if you looked for a copy and there were any secondhand copies, a secondhand copy sold for as much as 1,000 US dollars on Amazon. Mm. Thankfully, you know, they're not available anymore because that was very embarrassing. And I certainly didn't receive any of that money. But I wrote this poem, I published it in Canada. And here's one of the poems of the doubts that Pupato had as he sought in those 40 days and 40 nights to gird up his own loins and sum up the courage and the capacity to unify his people and to fight. Is it not too much to bear the symbol of unity? Is it not too much to ask an artifice? I pose our new armies sweep to the fight. Their leaders thank the king. He takes no credit. I am a fragile man, an accident. Until last month, I was circumspect. Is it not too much for any heart to bear? Does it not swell in endless tracks of service? To the rival leaders, I am an expedient. To the raw young men, I'm in the forest learning to turn on the sun. Oh, I've pitied myself these many days past. I have sung in these forests night after night. I am pleased to still feel, but this feeling is very great. Soon it will be evening again. These nights I've watched the same sun. It branches off these trees. I've sat here pretending my uncles were all around. Let not this head branch uncontrolled, not rake their schemes with my insufficiency. Oh, it will be evening again. How shall I reconcile these actors whose arms serrate with strength? You placed some hope in me. Let not your schemes wheel uncontrolled, nor crush my selfhood needlessly. So what I've tried to do in that book of poems is to personalize the struggle of the king as a necessary expedient to unify the people in order to resist. Now, my own background of this in New Zealand in the late 1960s and the 1970s. Somehow I wound up as the media advisor of the very first New Zealand women's liberation movement, the very first New Zealand gay liberation movement, and the media advisor to the Napamatoa, the young warriors modeled after the Black Panthers despite my not being female, not being gay, and not being Maori. So I sort of know what honorary status feels like, but very, very much got involved in the Maori struggle, far more than just being their media advisor. When I became a young newspaper editor, I published the country's first newspaper headlines in Maori, for instance, to try to propagate the idea of culture. But one of the leaders of the Nakamatoa, in fact, there were two brothers, Tara Eruera, who is a very, very good friend of mine, and his younger brother, who later took the name Tama Iti. They were very, very influential in leading the Nakamatoa. Many years later, long after I had left the country, but making one of my very, very rare returns to New Zealand, basically to give named and ceremonial lectures at the University of Auckland it was meant to be some kind of honor to do this. I landed to find that the younger brother, Tameiti, 
had been arrested on terrorism charges. And he had been trying to establish a commune in the Eruera Mountains. And the police were convinced that what he was trying to establish was a terrorist training camp. And so it was raided and it became an infamous and notorious example of police heavy handedness. I made a documentary when I was visiting New Zealand on that occasion, basically lamenting the decline in race relations, progress that had been made and taken a step backwards by such heavy handed action. And basically calling upon at least the university and the intellectual communities to make a stand where, as far as I could see coming from the outside, there was no visible stand on behalf of the Maori people. They too seemed offended by the manifestations of a radical nature on the part of Tame Iti, who by that stage had, had himself, his face covered with traditional Maori tattoos. He actually looked frightening to uneducated eyes. For him, it was a declaration of cultural value and cultural authenticity. He was of course exonerated, the police were heavily criticized. The whole operation had cost several million New Zealand dollars. And the film I made about this, it was a documentary interview film, was entered into several local film festival competitions. And even that greatly alarmed me. That had to take that kind of intervention to alert the so-called educated cultured public to the fact that something was going on that they had to wake up to, and that is in a small country. Race relations should have been a lot better. You know, they're getting better, they're still far from perfect to this day. But what you had was the continuation of a tradition of Maori efforts to try to imprint values, and particularly values related to land, onto the New Zealand consciousness and for successive governments to try to take this seriously. To a certain extent, there are still land protests going on, not land wars anymore. This whole issue of who owns what is not yet settled. In 1840, there was what was called the Treaty of Waitangi. The first British governor, a very idealistic young man called Captain Hobson, gathered together a convention of Maori chiefs and said, we will honor your ownership of lands and you will agree to be members of the British Empire. Well, they signed, but the treaty was pretty much comprehensively dishonored by the settlers after the signatures. And it was because it was dishonored by the white settlers that the Maoris resorted to violence. Now, the Eruweras were Tamaiti was trying to establish his commune as the home of a tribe, an ethnic group, a community group called the Tuhai. And what Tamaiti was trying to do was to follow in the footsteps of Tekuti, the prophet leader of the Tuhoi people in the Eroeras as they resisted white settler colonialism. So Tommy Yuti deliberately chose a continuation of this theme. He himself was Tuhoi. But the whole idea of resistance and the whole idea of resistance through a belief system which was syncretic, Maori values, but absorbing like Patata first, the king of the Maoris, absorbing biblical influences. Judith Binney called her for redemption songs. It's not by chance that it sounds the same, it is the same as the Bob Marley song, Redemption. It's a Christian value, but adopted both by the Rastas, but also by the Maori people as a sign that God will redeem them from slavery. In this case, the slavery of white domination that confiscates their land. And the values implicit in 
that uh, the spirits live there, ancestors live there, cultural values that arrived from there. So Tekuti, after many exploits of a military nature, audacious military actions, some truly heroic, wanted to leave a legacy. He wanted to use certain instrumentalities to mobilize his people. And then afterwards, when he was no longer actively fighting, to leave a legacy for the next generation. And the British thought it politic not to arrest him. They realized this would cause more trouble than it was worth. But these redemption songs that Professor Binney goes on in a huge book to analyze, to record, and to interrogate in terms of their component parts. These are combinations, these songs are combinations of poetry and sermons. These sermons are part Maori values, part Christian values, part the teachings of a prophet and part the teachings of a community leader who had made a stand. And because they were written down, Te Kuti could write, what you have is a recorded archive. Judith Binney calls them redemption songs. These are songs of rebellion. And these songs of rebellion are a record. It's a huge long book, as I said. And Maori language, as I've tried to explain to you, is very, very poetic. I hope I got some sense of that across to you. So these redemption songs, these songs of rebellion, these are things that are part of the New Zealand historical record. They continue to inspire to this day, but they form as it were an archive of reasons for rebellion which are very, very different from what exists almost anywhere else. So side by side with the missionary archives, which as I said, are housed and so as, you get the views of the missionaries. You have what the Mara people did with missionary teachings. They incorporated them into their own brand of thought, articulation, poetry, songs, songs of rebellion. This makes someone like Tekuti unique. He wasn't the only one. If you view the filmed lectures from previous incarnations of this course, you will see there's a long line of Maori leaders who led the battle against the European settlers. Rikuti probably deserves to be called the greatest of all of these. Patatao I, the king of the Maoris, basically expresses the idea of Maori organization along modern lines and what were then modern times. Both left the legacy, as I said, the Waikato area in the center of the North Island is still called the King Country. The University of Waikato, when it was established, had a special mandate to propagate Maori studies. The first professor of Maori studies was located at the University of Waikato. But the radical, youthful wing of the Maori community, they're epitomized by Tamehiti, his so-called terrorist training camp in the Arawaros. In a line of descent from Tukuti, and a line of descent which has his intellectual component in the songs of redemption and of rebellion. So ladies and gentlemen, rather than trying to repeat, once again, what is already available to you on the BLE, 
what I've tried to do is to bring, as it were, some context, some not so much color, but as it were, some sense of the values and the poetry which was used to mobilize people. I promised you last week I would sing. Okay, you had me do poetry, both my own and the Maori poetry that was recited on the death of Judith Benny. I promised to give you a few lines, the opening lines of the New Zealand national anthem, the Maori version. The English version is called God Defend New Zealand. And it seems that the Maori version begins with a similar sentiment. But the European English version basically just calls upon God to defend New Zealand almost as a matter of right. You know, defend us, for God's sake. And the Maori version has an inflection. It's not always available as an inflection in literal translations. But basically what the words are saying is, defend us if you see merit in us. In other words, to be meritorious is what gets redemption from heaven. Please excuse my singing. the national anthem. I should leave this lecture with one personal credit, and that's to my father. He was the youngest family head in the Auckland Chinese community. At dawn every morning, he would go down to the auction markets to stock up the family fruit and vegetable business with goods that you bought at auction wholesale. These were delivered on a truck, a delivery business run by a distant relative, and we as children called him Uncle Goofy because he looked like Goofy in the Walt Disney comics. We loved him very, very much. But he had married a Maori woman. And there was racism not just on the part of white New Zealanders towards the Maori, but racism towards the Chinese from the white European population. And you know what it's like, those who are discriminated against always look for someone lower down on the feeding chain. We're not as bad as them. And so even many senior members of the Chinese community looked down in a discrimination fashion upon the Maori. So when Uncle Goofy died, he had his own market garden. There was a huge debate among the Chinese family heads about going to his funeral. And many of the more conservative Chinese family heads said, we can't go. His wife will be there or her relatives will be there. You will have to mingle with Maori people. And my father as the youngest family head stood up and said, you're all without honor. He was one of us. By marriage, she is one of us. I, for one, am going to attend the funeral. Everyone was shamed and everyone went to the funeral. But when I was told that story, much, much later on, well, it sort of explained why I was drawn participate in 
a key stage of what we now call the Maori Renaissance, the regrowth after their defeat in the War of Liberation, the defeat of those who fought underneath Apata first and Kakuti, the Maori people went into a decline, a huge loss of morale. They'd fought so hard. The land still wasn't theirs. The Maori Renaissance basically began in the 60s and 70s and to a large extent spearheaded by young people emulating international sources like the Black Panthers in the United States, but redeveloping a sense of culture and nationhood, which has been carried on to this day. New Zealand is not a perfect society. It's much more successful than it was before at race relations, at least in recognition of a superficial nature of Maori society and language. Almost everyone speaks a few Maori words. And of course, you have the appropriation, if you like, but really the very good use of Maori culture in terms of the haka. Everyone does the haka. The Maori people don't call this appropriation. They would simply like white people to do the haka better. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. But before every international rugby match, of course, male rugby or female rugby, the haka is performed as a challenge. Uh, this is a challenge for battle. It's a challenge in terms of now you declare your culture too. It's also a challenge of defiance. So, Ekuti, Potata, these were leaders of challenge, leaders of defiance. In the case of Tekuti, he left a huge legacy, songs of redemption, songs of rebellion. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.